Hi, it's Mark Owen from Moose Marketing PR, the editor of Punchline Magazine. Uh, today, we've got Laurie Bells, Chief Executive of the Cheltenham Trust. Welcome to Punchline Talks, the big interview. Welcome, Laurie. Nice to see you again. Thank you. It's lovely to see you, Mark. I can't believe it was nearly two years ago since I've seen you. I know. And, and we had our big meeting and then we never saw you again. <laughs> I know. I think the pandemic got in the middle of it, though, Mark, to be fair. So life changed for all of us literally a year ago from today, almost. Well, I, I, I was a, you know, a little bit offended at first. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. No, I promise no. nothing personal. It's great to see. It's great to see. So we've got to start at the very beginning, that's okay. What is the Chapman Trust? How many buildings? How many people? What's the turnover? Can you explain a little bit about that, please? Yeah, of course. So for people that don't know what the Cheltenham Trust is, the Cheltenham Trust was um, an independent charitable organisation set up um, six years ago now. And it delivers at arm's length from the council, basically um, a number of um, cultural and leisure services. And we're probably one of the lead providers in Cheltenham of those services. And we do that from a number of venues, which will be quite familiar, I think, to people who are local. So one of the venues is Cheltenham Town Hall, where we do a huge programme of entertainment from there. We also run the garden bar outside of the town hall in Imperial Gardens. We run the pump rooms, um, which many, many people will be familiar with the pump room and um, it, it, wonderful, iconic grade one listed building. But we also uh, put a cafe in here, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about um, when we go through this interview. We also run uh, the Wilson Art Gallery and Museum right in the heart of the town. And then we run Leisure At at Cheltenham, so the big Leisure At Centre, and also the Prince of Wales Stadium. So quite an eclectic mix of uh, culture and leisure, as I've said, um, and, and we do a huge, huge variety of events and activities across all of those venues for the community and for visitors to Cheltenham. Our turnover pre-COVID was around five million plus per year. And I currently employ around, it, it, it was about pre-COVID 200 staff, of which around 100 are casual staff. And then on top of that, we have a whole bank of volunteers that also support the delivery of the services and activities that we provide. So I'm assuming that a lot of the staff are furloughed at the moment. Yeah, in fact, Mark, nearly all staff were furloughed when we first went into lockdown a year ago. And I kept and retained a very, very small core team um, that, that actually um, have been the business team um, that have helped repurpose the, build, the, the business throughout the COVID lockdown and throughout the whole of the pandemic year. And it's still that core team that are in the business now. So I think we're all fortunate at the moment that we can use flexible furlough. And we've been doing that, bringing resources in as we need to, as we can remobilize different parts of the business. Uh, it's such an eclectic mix of different types of venues and, or, you know, and, and staff. It must have been when you came in two years ago, let's be honest about it. The, the finances for the Chantley Trust weren't looking too great. Let's be honest about that. So how did you manage to sort it out? Or did you actually manage to sort it out before we went to lockdown? Yeah, that, that's a big question. So, but you're absolutely right. I think, um, there was um, a lot of recognition that the trust had and um, perhaps had a few challenges and struggles in its first five years. So when I joined, um, I was brought in really to look at, um, on, a, on an interim contract, by the way, for one year, which has obviously been extended now, but um, I was brought in to see whether or not the trust could become financially sustainable because we're in quite a privileged position where we, we're actually um, here trying to make a number of historic and heritage buildings sustainable. And to do that, you have to really um, almost interpret that by, by having a very careful blend of culture and commercial. And I think the trust had struggled to get that blend right previously. So when I came in, the first thing that I was tasked to do was to, to look at a five-year plan for the next five years of the trust, working very closely with our main sponsor and partner, which is Cheltenham Borough Council, looking at, okay, how could we make the, 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 the venues more sustainable? and start to get that, that increased blend of commercialism alongside the cultural offer that we, we provide. 
So um, I have to be absolutely honest, when I first came in, I did a real deep dive into all of our finances to really, really understand where it is that we spend money. But most importantly, where is it that we could bring uh, money in, generate income and look at the commerciality value of, of the organization and where it could maximize its potential? Because clearly there were a number of the buildings that I, I felt could be doing an awful lot more, both for the community, but also for those people that wanted to have private hires or a different program of events and, and schedule of activities. So we started to look at that. We developed a five-year plan. There is absolutely no doubt that this organization can be sustainable. It just needed a, a quite, quite a shift and change in the way in which it did things and the, and the how it was going to deliver and what it was going to do. And that included um, revising a number of our contracts, including that we had all of our catering was outsourced when I came in. That wasn't working for the trust. It wasn't working either financially or in terms of customer experience and offer. So we brought all of catering back in house um, in the first year that I was here. So within a few months, we were literally doing that. Um, which I have to say has been an absolute gift for us ready for the pandemic. It was almost fate. And we delivered a, a new five-year plan that really set out with, with some investment. There was some investment needed that we, we basically set out a capital program of what was needed to, to increase our offer and to make us more sustainable alongside a very, very clear plan for every single venue and for what we could achieve. And that was signed off just before we went into COVID. And I have to say that the trust had not had a record of delivering a surplus year on year, had struggled basically to do any growth. And even with the pandemic shutting us down, literally on the 16th of March, so almost a year ago to the day, at the end of our 2019-20 year of accounts, which are just being signed off at the moment, we have delivered um, a, a, a good surplus. I won't say how much, but it's oh, it's, come a, on. it's it's between friends. <laughs> well, I'll say it's all it, it's it's almost fifty thousand. So well done, which, congratulations. We were, yeah, we were projecting. I mean, now we're we're looking at much much more ambitious than that. I have to be honest. And as we move into the next five years, it will be very different. But, but it, for us, that was a big landmark because it, it, what it did was it proved that the changes we were starting to make, and we were only beginning, we were only on the, the, the start of the journey then, they were beginning to have an impact. And I think that's the important factor here is that we knew that by changing the model, we could start to make a difference. However, what I would say is the pandemic hit and then took us into a completely different modeling. So our five-year plan that I did pre-COVID is now ripped up in the bin and we are starting again because we have learned so much. We've tested a lot, we've, we've taken risks, we've, we've gone for the art of the possible and we've just learned loads. So you know, when I look back at that five-year plan, at the time it was right, at the time it was it was ready, but now very, very different. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an oven-ready plan, was it, by right, chance? No, no. Sorry, um, I've, got to, I've got to ask you, so when, when you, obviously you, you took this over, you were looking at the figures, how did you communicate that? How did you delve into the actual figures? Was it pretty obvious where you were losing? Money, you say about the catering, obviously an ex-chef, I know that's very easy to lose money on the catering side. Or was there other areas that you could easily recognize uh, problems and... Um... The, 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 these are really challenging questions and they're really good because um, to do something like this is, is, is never easy. It's, it's about, it's understanding, it's getting that where is the expenditure and what are we spending money on and and are they the right areas and i'll give you an example i think the trust had struggled because um it has a dual role here so i'm just just going to be quite candid and and basically what we do is we provide a lot of what i would describe as community services and and those are ones that people can access entirely for free or subsidized, and in some cases, very heavily subsidized. Now, at the moment, in order to be able to deliver all of those services for free, and I'll give you an example, the Wilson Art Gallery Museum 
people can go in there at any time, walk in there and, and tour quite rightly all of the galleries, all of the museum artifacts and enjoy an experience in there. And they don't pay for that. They, 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 there's no fee to do that. And I know that's that's the ideal situation that we always want to retain because you want to bring history and art to life and allow people the opportunity to enjoy that. But it comes at a cost. And what I started to work through was all of the things that we do that are either free or subsidized, how much were they really costing the trust? And how much were we getting in a grant from the council to support those community activities? And did, did they balance? Did they balance? And what I discovered was that actually we were doing far more that was subsidized and free than we were actually getting grant aided from the council. And I've had that very open conversation with the council because we weren't sophisticated enough as an organization at that time or mature enough in, in our income generation to be able to meet the difference because we're still trying to generate enough money to pay for all of our staff and for everything else that we do that isn't um, free or subsidized. So the balance wasn't quite there. And I think that became very apparent. So what that, that leads you to then is, is choices. You have to then say, well, what we've got to do is until we can build up our income, we've got to now start saying, well, what is it that we can subsidize and what is it that we can do for free? And where can we minimize some of our expenditure? So we went through all of those exercises, including looking at, um, you know, structures and roles and looking at um, what did we have capacity and skill bases in the right places. So, for example, you know, the trust was very, very light on its communication and its marketing, you know, which for me, that's my background, as you know, Mark. And, and for me, that's an absolute given. How can you expect to increase footfall if you don't tell people about what you have to offer and what's actually happening? So we started to shift and realign some of our resource and capacity so that the, the, the trust was starting to make those significant changes that shift shift the dynamics and also we started to work very closely with the council having an open and direct communication about what are the things that are really important that we want to retain how can we work together to generate more income because some of the things that I wanted to do would need some small investment I'm not talking about major rebuilds or major money coming in but just things that would help us to actually increase footfall and make the offer more interesting so things like refurbishing the pump room which I'm sat in today the glorious pump room that I absolutely love you know it was just making it look a welcoming building, a building that could showcase how iconic it is and start to increase its usage and its footfall here. So we, we, we started to enter into a very open dialogue. And I think that's been incredibly useful because by working on that partnership and enabling the trust to find its feet and to start to put in place those, those foundations that it needed to build income, we are now beginning to be able to do that and some. So it, it, it was um, a very challenging, you're absolutely right, you know, we needed to rethink and remodel and do things very differently. And I came in, you know, with, with no agenda, you know, because I don't, I, I didn't have a background in any of the, the, the buildings, the venues or the delivery of culture or leisure in Cheltenham. So I came in with, um, I think that that fresh pair of eyes with no agenda at all and, and not involved in what had gone before. Not being funny, I mean, I've talked to Reverend Stephen Lake, and uh, he has an awful lot of volunteers, so he has a core member of staff, a lot of volunteers, I want to put words in his mouth, but part of the challenge is, is when you have the volunteers, you've got some paid staff, and bring them with you on this journey. Did you find that difficult as well? I, th I, th I think, I think that's, yeah... <laughs> You're right. I mean, volunteers is an absolute gift and it's something that, um, you know, it, it's incredibly valuable to have that resource where people want to give up their time and their energy to support what you're doing. Therefore, for me, any volunteer or we like to call them associates, actually, are part of the organisation. They're part of my teams. They're part of staff. 
So for me, the journey that we took staff through in terms of the change management program and starting to shift the emphasis of the trust and where it was focusing, all of the forums and the dynamics and the the different communication that we shared with, with staff. For me, all of those volunteers and associates are part of that team. So for example, when I first started in the organization, it seems like a really long time ago now, but when I first started, one of the first things I did was go out to everyone engaged in, in the delivery of services with, with the um, trust and say to them, if you were the new chief executive, right now today, if you could change three things, what would you do and why? And I, I asked everybody, whether they were a volunteer, whether they were a paid member of staff, whether they were casuals, whatever role they had for me is valuable. And therefore their opinion matters because it was through all of those forums that I started to see what needed to shift and change. And the people on the ground have often the very, very best ideas. No, I think I, I would like to put words in Stephen Lake's mouth, by the way. He, he obviously is very grateful for the volunteers that he has as well. He, he says backtracking progress rather quickly. Um, okay, so where we are now then, um, when are you due to start opening up uh, everything? Yeah, so the, the, the reopening, I have to be absolutely clear, cannot come soon enough. We, we are a people business. We're here to deliver th those, those wonderful cultural and leisure services people really need to help with their health and well-being. There's no doubt about that. So the sooner we can open, the better. So right now, we've, we've reopened the uh, the new cafe that, that we launched last year at the Pump Room. So that we opened last July. It was a test it and see. It's been phenomenally successful. It's just been a lifeline for so many people, including all of us working here. And we reopened it last Monday on the 8th of March and um, had a great week last week. Um, obviously, the weather's gorgeous at the moment, so that's helping too. But that's reopened because that's a takeaway and we're able to do that. So the, the, the garden bar and the tables and chairs coming back at the pump room will happen on the 12th of April. And we will also be reopening um, Leisure App. But again, it's a limited offer at the moment. So in line with the guidance, we are offering indoors from the 12th of April will be the gym and the pool but outdoors we're going to do something different we're going to be putting up a great big marquee at the rear of um, Leisure App that overlooks uh, Pitville Park and we're going to put that marquee up to host a whole range of exercise classes and all sorts of different activities out there and we're also going to put can you believe another pop-up uh, cafe there so that people who can't go into the cafe at Leisure App, we are putting the cafe outside. So if the weather stays good, there'll also be some um, seating arrangements there as well. So that people can sit and enjoy over that side of the park. So they can either be this side or that side and enjoy that. And then gradually, um, as we move into May, we can reopen inside the venues. But again, with limited capacity. So we're working through the program on that. And then from June, hopefully everything reopen and back to normal. The only venue for us that will stay closed though, Mark, right now, and for a very, very good reason, is the Wilson. So the Wilson, during lockdown, we were able to fast track um, a bequest, which was great, great news for us. So the Charles Irving Trust, that I think a lot of people in Cheltenham will know of the Trust because Charles Irving's left a legacy in many, many different projects across Cheltenham. Um, it, we were fortunate enough to um, have a significant request that's enabling us to create a brand new community art gallery that would have been on the, um, what, what's the mezzanine floor we call it, which was part of the um, cafe. Mm. Um, so a brand new art gallery will go on that floor and then the ground floor is going to be completely transformed into a new community arts cafe. And that arts cafe will give new spaces for young people, for, um, you know, a demographic that might want a slightly quieter area where they might want to sit and talk or listen to an appreciation talk. And also just a cafe that will host a whole range of activities and events from acoustic music sessions for students through to performing arts, through to um, all sorts of talks and just generally a, a very lively space. So that's all going, that's all happening at the moment. Um, and we, we, we 
Uh, we, we're still not quite sure of the timeline for actual reopening, but it certainly won't be until probably the late autumn at the at the very earliest at the moment, because it's quite a big project. But when it does reopen, it's going to reopen with um, a very, very different offer, very vibrant building. And we, we hope that that will tie in with the new innovation park to um, the rear of the Wilson um, adjoining the Minster grounds. I mean, it sounds absolutely fantastic. Really, really excited about it. I know we sort of touched on it before. And, and obviously what's happening in Cheltenham anyway, especially when the cyber park, if that uh, all, all comes comes forward, which it, it definitely will. Um, I'd like to talk to, talk to you about yourself, actually, because when I first met you, you'd come from Salisbury. You were the marketing communication manager for Salisbury Council. Is that right? And... Um, uh, and um, you were in charge of the communication during the Novichok um, crisis poisoning there. Can you tell me a little bit about that and about your background? Yeah, so, so you, you, you're right. I was in my last year um, in Wiltshire, I was based in Salisbury, but I actually worked for Wiltshire Council, which is a big unitary. So, yes, yeah, Salisbury does have its own um, town council, but I actually work for Wiltshire Council. So my role at Wiltshire Council was one of the directors there and I, I was um, overseeing and leading all of the work with communities and with uh, communications. So on the community side, just to give a little bit of background there before I moved to Novichok, um, so on the community side I ran um, basically um, 31 libraries which which we managed to keep open with with the help of volunteers so we had a whole very different program of working there which is where I've had the experience of working with volunteers. I also ran 23 leisure centres as well as um, all of the what they called area committees which is how do you get decision making in local communities that reflect their needs and and um, getting the right projects and investment on the ground in local communities. So quite a big program of work on the community side, as well as de developing um, a whole program of new campuses. And that's about where do you bring all your services together? So with, with other partners. So campuses that were um, across the whole of Wiltshire that would include all of your leisure, your culture, your partners like the police, health, all sorts of different things, all into one campus. So that was a very new and different type of project that, that Wiltshire was quite a trailblazer on at the time. And I also um, learned a lot there about how do you make um, facilities sustainable and how do you make them more commercial? So how do you look at that, that balance of partnership working with leasing space, with creating com commercial space through retail or or cafe culture, whatever it happens to be. So a lot of that learning was, was incredibly useful for coming to the Trust. And then the other part of my role, which is my, my main background, is communication. So communication with marketing and engagement, huge part. And in my last year at Wiltshire Council, we obviously had the big Novichok incident that hit in 2018. Um, and it, it, it was on March the 4th. I mean, I can remember it vividly. You know, it was at the time when it, it was the beast from the east had hit the country, particularly the south of the country. And the whole of, um, it, I don't know if you remember, but the A303 that ran through um, past Stonehenge was completely blocked. So we were already in emergency mode and, and the councils have, you know, basically... Um, Different, different emergency alerts. We were on gold command at the time and I was leading the communications, working on the fact that, that people were stranded on the A303, they couldn't access any facilities. And then as the thaw was coming and we were, we were alleviating from that crisis, moving away from it, we, we then had the call that something had happened in the centre of Salisbury. And of course, we all know now that it was, um, you know, uh, the, the, the scripples that, you know, the, the, the father, Sergei, and his daughter, Yulia, that had um, obviously um, been subject to a Novichok attack in the centre of Salisbury. And, and the rest is history, as they say. So overnight, Salisbury, that was one of our busiest marketing towns and um, you know uh, market towns I should say and obviously a, a major tourist destination in um, Wiltshire and the south of England particularly people coming to see Stonehenge and then going into Salisbury to see the cathedral um, you know and, and the wonderful um, you know uh, you know centre of Salisbury that has so much to offer overnight became an absolute ghost town so um, the the, the 
the, co- the running the communications on that and the recovery of the communications was a huge task because there was it was at all different levels. So it's the reassuring messages to all of the local residents that need to access Salisbury for all of their facilities and amenities, as well as you know the visitors and bringing tourists back, as well as also you know managing all of the fake news throughout that period of time, which was absolutely phenomenal. Because as we all now know, you know it's perfectly normal for two Russian people to fly over for a weekend to have a look at the spire and they know the height of the spire and then fly home again. Um, You know, so uh, I jest, but it was a phenomenal time. So the learning, um, you know, I've done many, many crisis communication over over my years and I've never dealt with anything quite on a scale like that. And also something that most crises, when you work in them, you know, you work through a period of time and a crisis usually hits. So, for example, if you have flooding or something like that, which is hugely difficult for everybody and it impacts badly on a lot of businesses and, and homes. But often the actual communication and the management of that crisis will be quite short term in the scale of things. It'll only ever be probably a few days or maybe 10 days at the most. You know, the Novichok incident went on for for 10 months plus, you know, and it still bubbles now. You know, you still hear things about it now. You know, I can remember going on a trip to um, uh, the States and we were on the West Coast and somebody said, oh, you know, you know, where do you live? Had to give our address and said in Wiltshire. And said, oh, my God, are you near Salisbury? Where it all, you know, and they all knew about it. Everybody knew about Salisbury, but for the wrong reasons. So it's it's then how do you turn that into a positive? So it was learning about, you know, you've got to turn around all of that. So, so yeah, that was my final year at Wiltshire Council was, was um, managing the communications for Novichok. And I think when you go through something like that, and you you fire on crisis and for all of the businesses and all of the people viewing this that have ever lived and breathed a crisis, you will know you pump on adrenaline. And it's very, very difficult to go from that environment and sustain it and then go back to what I would describe as business as usual. That's a, that's a really hard ask because suddenly you've been every day you're in that crisis go go move move it's it's you know it's command and control and it's do 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 and you can't ever ease away from it because the next thing will hit and constantly throughout that 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 10 months every day there was something that needed managing dealing with and quickly you do you don't have time to go away and pontificate on it this is urgent communications that need to go out um, or to be managed, or people needed to be briefed, or you needed to work with the, with the, the, the media. And of course, we had international media camped on the doorstep for, for many, many months there. And I think it's it, it's very hard then to go back to, you know, what was my old role? It's a bit like now, you know, you think pre-COVID days, what do they really look like anymore? We, none of us, I don't think, I think we've moved on. And that's that's how I felt. So to come to the trust, just to bring you full circle, that was part of why I um, I needed a new challenge. You know, I needed something that I could take my energy to, fresh, different, and 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 have something that took me from an adrenaline pumped fueled environment into a new challenge. So, and I have to say, um, it's been quite adrenaline here over the past year too. <laughs> so does that sum me up? Sorry, that was a bit. There was a lot there. Don't worry, don't worry. What I have learned today is that you do a really good American accent, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're running out of time. These, these, the, these interviews I do always run out of time. I could talk forever, really, with you. Um, very quickly, then, what are the business opportunities? So, you know, for businesses in Cheltenham or in Gloucestershire, a quick minute on what's, what, what opportunities can they work with the Trust what could you do for the trust for businesses? Where could they help you guys make money or where could you actually help them make money? Well, well I think the, the one thing I would say is that the trust sees itself as being um, in, integral to the local economy and working very, very closely in partnership with, with businesses. So for us, you know, this is about partnership working and it's about, you know, we've got the most amazing venues, we've got the most amazing spaces, both, you know, inside and outside. And it's really looking at, you know, if a business wants to do something that to either showcase its business or to network, um, you know, or to raise its own profile, then please, please come and talk to us because there are lo- lots of opportunities where we can work together. And we host 
conferences, we host many events, and we, we really, really relish the opportunity to do things like that because we can make that work for the business too. So we've got, you know, our, our profile has increased through the pandemic. We opened two brand new cafes. They've been phenomenally successful. Our social media reach now is over 150,000, you know, so we know that, that people now see the trust as, as, as um, one of, one of the, the, if you like, you know, one of the lead organizations for culture and leisure, but also in terms of helping the, the economy and the footfall and the visitors. So any opportunity where we can work with local businesses, we would welcome it. Fantastic. OK, we're wrapping up. Top three tips for businesses, please. Ah, that's a good one. So I would say based on um, our learning over the last year, but also a little bit about my, my background, I would say that for me, that the first thing I would always, always do is say have absolute clarity of your vision and purpose. You know, where are you heading and why are you doing that? Particularly at the moment where, where businesses have had to repurpose, keep reevaluating what's your vision and where are you heading and never, never derail yourself. Keep focused on where you're going and why you're going there. I would say that the second tip is to make sure that you work with a team that are agile, that they are responsive that they love to be flexible and they embrace change and actually enjoy that and move with it because you're never going to grow if you can't if you can't take the right people with you that are ready for that and then the other thing i would say is that for me every day is a learning day you never stop learning so so learn all the time learn from others get that feedback, learn from yourselves, look at everything that you're doing and keep reviewing, revising and moving forward, but always linking back to your vision. Laurie Bell, it's been a real pleasure to see you again and, and, and have this conversation. Thanks so much for your time. And hopefully I'll see you very soon and have a lovely coffee together there at the pump rooms. I can't wait, Mark, and you are so welcome here at any time. And any of your viewers, please, please come and see us at the cafe. We love to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking part in Punchline Talks. Bye.